We'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us. And thank you to everyone who's online and is um, watching this session. You've made it to the end of the day. So glad to see that you're still here. I will be uh, introducing this final session. Uh, my name is Lauren Annenberg. I'm a senior program officer with JSI on USAID's Maternal and Child Survival Program. And first, let me introduce my colleagues here at the table. Dr. Falake Olayinka is a public health physician and team lead for the USAID-funded Maternal and Child Survival Program's immunization team, Falake, on the far left. Um, Dr. Disha Ali is also a public health physician and the measurement, monitoring, evaluation, and learning advisor for MCSP's immunization team on your far right. And in the middle, Leanne Doherty, um, public health expert and leading the research um, activities for MCSP's RI program. And I help manage MCSP's RI program in Nigeria. Uh, in the next hour, we'll be presenting learnings from program implementation on the use of geospatial information systems technology in routine immunization, or RI, service planning in two northern Nigerian states. We'll present for about 40 minutes and then take questions from you in the audience. And when you have those questions, you can approach the mic and we'll be happy to answer them. So just briefly, I'll be giving a bit of background and then my colleague Disha will be speaking to some of the specific challenges with RI due to poor planning and data quality um, in these northern Nigerian states. Uh, Leanne will then speak to how we have applied GIS to RI microplanning. And finally, Falake will be discussing um, findings from our implementation experience, some of the differences that we found between the hand-drawn and the GIS maps, and what that has meant for health workers and health system managers. A bit of background first. Um, immunization status in one of the most populous countries in the world, Nigeria, is unique. Um, according to the 2016 Multi-Indicator Cluster Survey, or MIX, Nigeria had over 4 million unimmunized children. This is the highest number of unimmunized children in the world, and it's more than a quarter of all unimmunized children globally. The 2016 MIX survey also revealed an all-time low immunization coverage rate for DPT-3. That's diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccine, which is commonly used as a coverage indicator. It was only 33% nationally as of 2016. And just for reference, global coverage um, is estimated by WHO at 85% in 2017. And neighboring countries such as Benin was at 82%, Chad was 46%. So 33% nationally um, shows that there's room for improvement. There are wide variations in RI um, system performance across Nigeria's states. Um, generally, there's higher performance for routine immunization in the southeast and southwest, and lower RI performance in the northeast and northwest. These two northern states highlighted here, Sokoto and Bauchi, uh, have very low percent of children fully immunized by their first birthday, only 2% in Sokoto and 14% in Bauchi. Over 40% nationally um, do not receive any vaccines from the health system. There are many reasons why children aren't being vaccinated in Nigeria. According to the MIX survey as of 2016, one of those reasons was a lack of awareness of RI services and the importance of routine immunization, a myriad of service delivery issues that we'll be speaking to today, mistrust or fears of the immunization system and of vaccination, and a lack of time or other family issues that impede people's ability to go um, and receive vaccination for their children. So speaking to these service delivery issues, particular, particularly poor data quality and planning, uh, my colleague Disha will uh, take over from here. Disha. Thank you, Lauren. Good afternoon. Um, as Lauren mentioned, I will walk you through the, mic, the, the use of geographic information system and its use in um, mic planning and uh, for data quality. So how GIS-driven um, 
G GIS can help routine immunization system in Nigeria. At the heart of any routine immunization planning is uh, the uh, routine immunization implementation is planning. As Lauren mentioned, there is a huge number of population out there who are unimmunized. In order to reach them, there needs to be good planning at national level, at district level, at health facility level. Some of these are called macro planning, national level, district level, and also micro planning, which is at the health facility level, meaning that identifying the catchment area of the um, health facility, where the different villages are within that health facilities catchment area, what what are the uh, impediments reaching those um, villages and all these it needs to be planned out properly in order for a proper implementation of routine immunization system. GIS can be helpful in this. GIS also is very helpful in effic efficiently allocating resources because planning is important and which actually helps for resource allocation. For example, how many vaccines do they need in order to reach all the children? What would it cost and how to take those uh, vaccine, uh, what it will take to transport the vaccine to reach all the kids? And then GIS could be useful to actually identify accurately what numbers of children or the target population to estimate. Prior, uh, so, up until now, in most of the countries, use census data, which is often old, so which is most of the time inaccurate. GIS can be very helpful in identifying or accurately the number of uh, target population to be reached. Also, beyond this, GIS-driven data can also be helpful for monitoring program, like whether the number uh, th that is supposed to be reached has been re uh, has been actually reached. So all this thing helps in planning, helps reaching the uh, target population, and thus helps um, properly implementing routine immunization system. I'm giving you an example here. It's how GIS helps in planning. As I mentioned, GIS helps to identify the target population. And traditionally, as I already mentioned, this census data is being used for assessing the target population. Here you can see um, we are using a made-up number. In 2006 census data, according to census data in a district, we need to reach 200 kids. But in GIS, when it, when it is applied in, it, it estimates the target population accurately. We can see actually the number of kids, children to be reached is 250. So how it actually affects the overall, it's only 50, but it still affects the planning. How does it affect? So annually, maybe there is, um, you see, pentavalent vaccine. There are three vaccine for 200 kids, three vaccine to reach a 90% coverage with a vestige rate of 1.3. According to the census data, we need 718 vaccine. However, in reality, when we apply GIS, which is more accurate, we actually need nearly 890 um, vaccines. So there is already a gap. So this is how, you know, we already see how these um, difference can influence the planning. Also, there is, as I said, the resource allocation. It has budget implication. If we under, under budget for the number of vaccines to be purchased, we miss out the you know, required vaccine, or if we over budget and then we waste our um, precious, um, in the developing countries, precious resource. So this is how the GIS can be very instrumental in um, helping proper planning. This is a little bit of example of how GIS can also, GIS can also help in our monitoring and also like indicators that we generally use. For example, this is an indicator of DPT3 Penta3 coverage. 
Um, GIS we f can be used to properly estimate the target, which is the denominator here. Bef prior, when census data was used, sometimes we it was it's a, it's a projection. We might there were like the coverage would come like over hundred percent. Then we wouldn't know whether it was the data quality of the numerator, whether really data has been inflated, or whether the target population were not was not properly estimated. GIS could be very instrumental also identifying estimating the accurate target population and eventually in it does help to um, improve the data quality and indicators. In Nigeria, giving with all for proper planning, for proper estimation um, of the um, target area, identifying the geospatial uh, coverage, basically this learning activity is asking this broad question, how can Nigerian states use GIS to produce more accurate primary health care for health facility catchment area maps and population estimates. This broad question is being asked through three different sub-questions which are very, in, very instrumental and in-depth uh, learning activities. First, what processes are required to generate PHC map using GIS? Why PHC, generating PHC map is so important? Because as I mentioned, up until now, we were using census data, and the health facilities were actually using hand-drawn maps for micro-planning. Like, oh, there is a village here, there, this, this, there is a, a bridge here, there is a river here, but this is uh, almost like um, perception and then hand drawn not to the scale not to not really um, the locations were not clear so this GIS map is coming to produce like a, a, a using a different kind of maps and we all know how GIS maps look so that is one question we are asking through this um, learning activity. Then, of course, the end users, the health facility uh, work, health, healthcare workers and their managers, they are so used to hand-drawn map. How are they act, e, perceiving the usability of the GIS drawn map? Are the GIS drawn map accurate? You know, it's GIS, but maybe there are something um, still missing in the map. So that's another step of question that we are asking through this um, activity. And finally, what we are asking: How do the how do the population estimated applying GIS? Uh, and identifying the settlements and village influence the vaccine strategy? And how do they differ from the traditional way of doing it? And is it a big difference? Is it a is it a little different? Or what's the scope of this work? These questions are being asked in this um, learning activity. And I'm handing over to my colleague, Leanne, who will walk you through the detailed process and the findings. Thank you. Thank you, Disha. Um, so now that we, we are going to start to think a little bit more about the process that was used, that we used to generate maps in Nigeria. And before we start to build a map, we have to think about what we need to see on that map. And so for routine immunization microplanning, we need to know the name and the location of the health facilities in the area that we're looking at. We also need to know the names and locations of the settlements that report to those health facilities. We need to know the target populations for those settlements so we can calculate resource needs, as Disha mentioned. And we also need to know points of interest, landmarks, such as rivers, hills, markets, churches, schools, and that sort of thing. And this can help to orient us on the maps to where things are. And then finally, we need to know the distances from the settlements to the health facility. So we need to gather that information. And so the first step in producing our maps is we need to go out and gather this information in order to populate the maps. Um, the next steps is to conduct the geo data geospatial data processing and analysis. 
and then finally produce and validate the maps. So I'll walk you through these steps a little bit more clearly now. So in the information gathering stage, um, we have a number of um, different variables that we need to look for. Um, so the government of Nigeria has, as most governments do, has a list of all the PHC facilities providing RI services. And so we're able to capture that list and, um, and uh, some information from their existing microplans already exist in terms of the list of settlements that these um, primary health care facilities uh, include in their annual vaccination um, service delivery. Um, but in Nigeria, we also have a situation where they've been going through polio eradication efforts with lots of um, uh, campaigns targeted um, at delivering vaccines. And um, this effort through polio eradication has led to the creation of a, a, another data source called the Vaccination Tracking System, which is actually a open, it's available on the internet, you can download. Um, and this vaccination tracking system, which was put together by a group of partners, um, and, and um, it, it is, uh, pulls together information where they use satellite images, remote sensing to um, identify all of the structures in the, um, in the area where they were planning on doing these campaigns. And, um, and then they also complement this information of the identification of the different structures by going out and sampling certain areas and collecting target population information or population size. Um, and then they use the, the sampling um, estimates for the different populations, and they're able to attribute um, information from one, um, like so for example, if you have a densely, popula a densely populated area with a lot of structures, um, they can use the estimates generated from those um, images and apply them to similar looking images in order to gather a full picture of what the population size would be. Um, same with more remote areas where there might be just like a single structure out in a, in a land area. Those pictures, they can attribute a similar population size to other similar looking pictures. And there's been several um, uh, articles in the literature that sort of validated this approach as um, being a, a fairly reliable and valid method for uh, estimating population size um, when you are not in a situation where you have a, a recent census like Nigeria. Nigeria, the last census was in 2006, so it's quite old. There's been a, a huge population growth, changes in urbanization and other um, patterns. So by using the GIS, you're able to come up with a more up-to-date um, population estimates for different areas. Um, so we were able to sort of leverage this information that was available through the VTS. Um, um, but we have to think a little bit about how polio eradication works and how routine immunization works. And they, they actually operate a little bit differently. So in polio eradication, um, because of campaigns, um, they go and they do house-to-house -house immunization service delivery. So they go to a house, they deliver the drops of polio vaccine to a child, um, and it's door-to-door -door health worker walking. And so they're looking at really small areas. They're looking at um, areas that a health worker can visit in a day. In routine immunization planning, our areas are bigger because um, they have different strategies for delivering vaccines. It's not door-to-door. -door, it's based on different locations, based on the distance from the health facility. Um, and so the way that we might think about a settlement definition for polio is going to be a smaller um, area than the way that you would think about it for routine immunizations. And so those definitions means that we have to come to some point of harmonizing the two. Um, so we'll talk about that, how we came to a point of harmonizing the two. Just mentioned the other data uh, um, and that we need for the, um, for the maps, the, the points, points of interest. We were able to gather that information um, also through the Office of the Surveyor General of the Federation. Um, we were able to leverage information on roads, railways, waterways from OpenStreetMap, and then administrative boundaries at the state and the LGA level in the local government area level in Nigeria. We collected um, through OSCOF and also through the global database of administrative areas. So those different data sources all pulled in, um, and they were already available through this polio geo database that we leveraged for this activity. So. Um, as you see, we have the, the original state routine immunization list of health facilities, 
And then we had this information from the Polio Geo database, and we needed to harmonize the two. So we went through a four-step process to do that. Um, so we first merged the two, um, the state RI list of settlements and health facilities with what was available in the Polio Geo database. And then those that weren't um, able to merge, we went back for further field data collection. And I'll, I'll go into that in a little more depth in a minute. Um, then we went back and reconciled the two files again, and then a final set of data quality checks. Um, so let me go now into a little bit more about the field data collection. Um, if you have uh, worked in quantitative field data collection, the process is very similar. Um, uh, basically working closely with the government, um, preparing your um, data collection tools and forms in advance, sending your field teams out to gather the information, engaging with the community so you make sure that you know um, exactly where you're going and that they're aware of your whereabouts and they're able to help guide you. Um, collecting that information, we use mobile phones uh, with them, uh, enabled to collect the GPS coordinate data, um, and then brought it back to the, the home office for data quality checking and cleaning, validating, and then uploading it into the database. Um, and so altogether, that's how we came to a final list of, um, uh, a final database that we use to populate the maps. Um, so once all the data was uh, available and ready to populate the maps, uh, I went through geo um, spatial data processing and analysis, um, which included first uh, um, plotting the, the points of the settlements in the health facility. And then we had to make sure that it was oriented for routine immunization planning. So that meant um, we had to make sure that there were catchment areas to find for the different vaccination strategies that RI uses. Um, in routine immunization, if uh, a community lives within two kilometers of a health facility, then those um, communities will report to the health facility for their vaccination services. They'll come to the facility. If they're between two and five kilometers, then the health uh, provider will go to a fixed point and meet the community there and provide the services there. And then those communities that are further than five kilometers, they'll actually take transportation out to those, to those areas. And so we wanted to make sure to draw sort of a catchment area around each of those three different distance points so that the service provider would know which communities fell into the fixed, which communities fell into the outreach, and then which ones would belong into the, to the mobile sessions. Um, so the sort of stages of, of analysis, you know, once we plotted them, then we do the, the points around the communities that fell within each group, um, smooth those out, and now we're ready to go. So here you see the, um, the two maps side by side. As Yisha mentioned, they had previously been using these hand-drawn maps, which you can see below. Um, and then to the side of that is, to the right of that, is the same uh, health facility catchment area um, with the geospatial map. Um, and, and what I kind of like to point out between these two is you see that in the, in the map, the hand-drawn map, all the facilities kind of look about you know, similar in distance to the health facility, but you can really start to see the, the distance spread um, for the electronic maps because they're able to capture um, sort of where they, they fall in reference to the health facility. Um, and so now we will go to Salake, who will tell you a little bit about what the experience was from our state and LGA managers when they saw these new maps. Um, thanks very much, Leanne. Um, using GIS tools um, and putting them in the hands of frontline health workers is really important to help them address challenges that they face every single day uh, in, in their ability to render immunization services to the communities that they serve. Um, in this process, it's a learning process that MCSP has undertaken um, to go beyond just estimating tiger populations, but making sure that the GIS is actually retooled, uh, retooled or used so that it's fit for purpose for routine immunization programs. And we've learned a few lessons. Um, one of the lessons that we learned is that the iconography uh, needs to be culturally sensitive. 
Uh, so the, the icons that are used to represent uh, health facilities or mosques um, or schools or landmarks need to be culturally appropriate to the, the context. And we, we learned that, that lesson uh, fairly early on in this process. Um, the second thing is that it, it takes time for people who are used to certain, uh, certain way of looking at a map uh, or certain culture of, of map usage to shift to digital and electronic uh, maps. So that time investment is needed to build the capacity and to train on the new features and, um, of the digital GIS maps. Uh, the third point I'd like to elaborate on is um, the need for a master health facility unique identifier list. Uh, this will help avoid duplication and also be more efficient because other programs can use the same list uh, without duplication or uh, the same uh, or double, uh, double counted of the same facility just because you didn't know it was that particular uh, facility. Um, and just to give a perspective of one of the um, the health workers, the, the local government EPI managers that was involved in, in this learning and iterative process, I said, look, when you look at maps, you think about things differently. Uh, you think about a settlement either alone or a type, and the type of strategy you're going to use uh, or that you need. So the vit visual depiction means something. Uh, and I think, you know, in, in his own words, he was trying to, to explain when you see a settlement alone, it tells you what kind of strategy um, that you will need for that uh, particular location. So let me just share a little bit what those, um, what we think those differences are between the hand-drawn uh, maps and, and the upgrade, if we can put it that way. Um, one of the first things, as my colleagues have alluded to, is that they're more accurate uh, population estimates. And as you can see, these have huge implications for uh, supplies, vaccines, commodities, resources, uh, and so on and so forth, and personnel costs as well. Uh, we look at better distance estimates. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, a, dis a difference between a 10 kilometer a uh, walk and a 20 kilometer walk, so, or five kilometer walk. So really having as much accuracy around the, the estimates help to determine what distance that health worker needs to travel to be able to ensure uh, vaccination services, or what distances do the communities and the caregivers need to travel to access uh, immunization services. Updated databases. We talked about the great value of having updated data, um, particularly around health facilities um, and other uh, information. The GIS allows us to do that and put that in the hand of, of managers and, and government for, for their use. I talk about more realistic uh, physical features. I'm going to tell you a little joke. When we were preparing for this session, uh, I was telling a story. I like to tell stories sometimes. Uh, about a stream. Uh, so with the hand-drawn maps, the stream looks just like a stream. But in actuality, it becomes a fairly big-sized river uh, during the rainy season and becomes impassable. Um, so looking at how it's drawn in the hand-drawn, but in actual representation, the physical feature requires you probably need a canoe um, you know, during certain months to be able to get across. And, the hand drawn maps don't allow us to see that as clearly as the GIS maps do. More accurate catchment area maps. Again, this allows us to ensure that there's equity in serving the populations and making sure that every village, every community falls within one catchment area or the other and that no one is left behind or left out. And then settlements, uh, settlements, villages, identified. Um, in some of the hand-drawn maps that we examined, uh, some villages were not captured in any of them, but people lived there. Uh, some were captured multiple times. So again, ensuring that um, all villages, all households 
are captured within these maps are some of the great differences and improvements that we find in using the GIS for the, for the maps. And then more accurate location of the settlements. A little bit about that. And then other key structures. Now, let me just pause here a moment. Having the key structures also affords utility for other health programs or other programs, such as schools, uh, markets, um, water, water uh, places. And uh, this allows this to be a, a, have multiple use uh, for development and health programs. Now, the lady on, what is that? Your right, good, is Rukaya. Rukaya works in one of the busiest health facilities in Sokoto, metropolis in Sokoto State in Nigeria. Uh, she is really very busy every day, but she is a really committed and dedicated health worker. And what she's finding is that the, the, the use of the GIS, um, not just the mapping, but using it for planning is helping her have a more accurate macro plan. And that means that she is able to plan for each and every child within her catchment area. The resources, the vaccines she needs, uh, the commodity supplies, she can plan her transport uh, to ensure that the number of outreaches that she needs are well captured and planned for. More equitable service provision uh, through targeted outreach and mobile services. Because the GIS gives her better plans and a better sense of distances, she can ensure that every community in her catchment area has some sort of service uh, to reach uh, the eligible populations. The knowledge of missing communities and the ability to, to have an appropriate community dialogue and engagement. Now this is really critical uh, because communities that have either, either been left out or did not appear on any of the maps um, provide an opportunity to engage um, for immunization, for health services, for education services. But that dialogue now becomes possible because they have been identified. And then the ability to plan travel time. Uh, she knows, Rukaya knows it's gonna take her three hours to get to that particular settlement. Um, and so she's able to plan appropriately to manage her time better to arrange the type of transport that she's going to use to be able to access it and plan her day and uh, the workforce. And then the visibility of opportunities for integration. Uh, again, this allows us to know, is this near a school? Um, and in that case, could there be some sort of integrated services? Or is this near a, uh, a mosque or a church? Could they offer that place for, for use during outreach, if that falls within an outreach location. So there, there's a whole uh, opportunity here for integration and collaboration. Now, on your left, uh, these are district managers or LGA uh, immunization managers, and they're at a slightly higher level. So they deal more with the, with the plans, the resources, and ensure that those resources are made available for the plans to be implemented. So they're, they're able to establish more realistic budgets, uh, better allocation of the resources. Who needs, certain, who needs certain amount of resources? Who needs more? Who needs less? And this will be evidence-based. And I think this is really, really an important base for accountability and transparency because there's an evidence base for the population for the resources that you need to be able to implement your uh, immunization programs. And then we have improved uh, planning and supervision. Again, we're talking about district managers, so they need to be able to go out and provide supervision support, uh, as well as mentoring, uh, to ensure that the immunization programs are of high quality. They can plan better. They can conduct their supervision um, in a more realistic way and a comprehensive way. Last mile vaccine and logistics. Uh, sometimes what we find are that um, vaccines are available at a higher storage level, but that they're not available at the health facilities on the front line. 
again, it is an issue of the, that last mile logistics and ensuring that uh, there's appropriate uh, allocations, the amount, but also the, the, the transport and the availability. The GIS helps us to establish better the quantities as well as the distances to ensure that all the last mile uh, service sites have adequate vaccinations and vaccines and supplies. And of course, the human resource distribution. Uh, with the GIS, you're able to better see um, how many health workers you need to a particular population or where there is a skewing, where you have much more uh, or many more health workers um, and where you don't have enough. So it helps you to address the issues of maldistribution of health workers and uh, inequity. Um, I did say I like stories, so let me give you one quick story and I'll move on. Um, so the, we did an assessment in, in the same Sokoto, and we found that they don't have enough health workers, uh, period. But the majority of the few health workers they have were concentrated in the town, in the metropolis, in the city. More than 70% were in the city. And so what happened is that when you go out of the city, uh, you really don't have an equitable distribution of the health workers. Uh, so, again, you were able to, to look at that, to map it, and redistribute or have the evidence basis for the needed redistribution of the health workers rather than anecdotes. Okay, so if you permit me, I'd like to go to a few concluding remarks. Um, using the satellite imagery to generate more accurate population estimates and settlement listings actually enables the routinization programs to overcome limitations of old data, old census data, uh, which oftentimes are a couple of years old, uh, sometimes a decade or more. Um, it allows the routinization to uh, extend its reach, to reach every child, um, improve our understanding of the geographical uh, landscape and, and close equity gaps, and also maximizes efficiency. And as I mentioned before, it provides uh, a stronger basis for accountability. Now with open, more open data sources for GIS, um, the options are becoming uh, more widely available. And so GIS is increasingly becoming an option uh, to use for spatial analysis for health planning. As our learning question showed, we did need to understand better how to um, make it fit for purpose. And uh, we, we hope that uh, what we're learning here will become useful for the broader community uh, in terms of using it for routine immunization uh, programming. Establishing a list of health facilities providing services with a unique identifier is critical and can ensure more accurate source data and robustness of the overall health system. Putting GIS tools in the hands of health workers and decision makers works and leads to new norms for planning, increased access to routinization services, and overall better outcomes. So at this point, I'd like to thank my co-facilitators, Lauren, Disha, and Leanne. Um, and we want to open it up for a uh, couple of questions or, or comments or for you to share your own experiences. And so we, we welcome that. Um, I understand there's a mic right in the middle of the, of the passageway here. Uh, feel free to, to use that and um, we'll, we'll take any questions or comments at this point. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I think one of the most interesting parts that you identified is the fact that this work that you've done is very applicable outside of routine immunization. So I was wondering if you could talk a little, little bit about potential for opening access to this work, especially because the maps, I think, would be incredibly valuable 
um, to a lot of different types of work, or even almost as like a quasi census, as you're saying, updating since 2006. Thanks. So thank you very much for that question. Um, we are really excited about the use of GIS uh, for routinization, and as you rightly identified, um, this can be used um, large in a much larger way, and is being used. In fact, uh, I think in routinization we're slightly behind the curve, uh, but what we're finding is that making it fit for that purpose required some adjustment, some deeper understanding um, from the caregiver side from the health provider side, and also being able to use the technology um, and the cartography itself. Um, so already we're aware that there are um, different uses. So for example, um, looking at urban areas, there's a lot of GIS being used in urban areas. Uh, we know that GIS is being used for HIV and AIDS programs in Ghana, and their ability to map out uh, service sites for uh, ART treatments, and um, there are multiple uses. We know that UNICEF is also doing some work uh, around use of GIS. Um, and in fact, they've put out um, a how to use guide. So again, I, I think really it's for us to, as a community, uh, to be able to find that, um, that convening or that platform that allows the multiple uses of the GIS to really um, come, come out um, for health or development. Um, I'm going to ask Leanne if she wants to add anything, anything to that, uh, but this is definitely something that we will be sharing largely um, with different communities and different platforms, and we continue to engage with others who are already using or plan to use uh, GIS either for education or health or broader development programs. But yes, there's already quite a bit of work um, going on on that, yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of interest right now in the particular areas where we're working um, in, in terms of sort of thinking about um, the RI system as a platform for looking at primary health care overall. Um, and so what this provides is, you know, a, a geocoded list of health facilities, which wasn't there before. Um, it also provides the population data, and it, the VTS has the, um, the target population for routine immunization, which is under one, but there's also under five total population. So you can then use those estimates for planning for other activities um, or other uh, 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 services provided under primary health care. So it would provide that um, information as well. Um, I'm trying to think if there was another. I think those are sort of the, the main additions at this point. Um, I think another thing that we sort of realized working through this process is you know, it, it took some time to get to a, um, a list of health facilities and settlements that were recognized by the communities. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there was the polio. Uh, list of settlements which were kind of smaller and not always recognized by the facilities, by the communities themselves, because um, they were s sort of smaller subsets. So this was an opportunity to go back and sort of define those based on um, how the community defines their, their, uh, their, their um, distances and, and um, uh, houses that are in, within that particular area, um, as, a, as opposed to the polio areas, which were just used for health worker purposes, they weren't used to sort of link back with the communities. Hey there. Um, my name's Natalie. I work at JSI across the river. So it's really nice to see some of the work that I don't um, get to see too much. Um, so my question was just about what kind of resources are necessary for the GIS mapping, um, whether you were able to find local capacity to conduct the data collection, and um, just your thoughts on scalability and um, even if maybe scaling down, doing this on a smaller scale is feasible. Sure. So we, um, we collaborated, collaborated with a group called eHealth Africa um, based in Nigeria. Um, and so they conducted the, the field data collection and were hosting the, the polio geodatabase um, and helped to produce the maps. 
The work was supposed to be designed um, and or is designed to use open data source. So um, a lot of the work was done with QGIS. Um, but I think there's some limitations in terms of the functionality and what that can do as opposed to um, ArcGIS or something that might be a little bit user friendly and easier to to get what you're looking for. So um, I think in situations where you, you want to be able to transfer it to the government without them having to maintain a software license, um, that's a possibility to use QGIS. Um, in terms of capacity, um, uh, I think there is capacity for, for um, you know, you'll find people who are trained and able to operate the software. Um, but some of the limitations we ran into was more in terms of making sure the underlying data um, that populated the maps was of good quality um, and reflected the situation on the ground when you talk to community members and health facility providers. Um, and so that took some um, attention to detail to make sure that we, we got that right. Um, the other thing I would say is that there, I think there's a need, and this probably cuts across a lot of people that are working with data um, right now, is the issue of sort of having, you know, we talked about having these standardized lists of health facilities, um, sort of setting up, n not just having one state in, in Nigeria having their health facility list, but making sure that there's some standardization and policies operational procedures at a national level that can help guide the states into a standardized process if that's possible or maybe maybe not maybe that's difficult in Nigeria but maybe wherever you're working that there's some sort of um, policy environment some sort of guidance and procedures about how to make sure that you have a unique listing of health facilities a unique listing of settlements so that you kind of um, have a cleaner data set to work with from the beginning. Thanks for that great question. Do you have a question? Yeah, I got one. Um, first of all, thank you very much. It was uh, very insightful. I appreciate it. And um, one of the things that I'm, I'm particularly appreciative of is it sort of really closes the loop on monitoring and evaluation and brings the learning component in, which seems to be missing in a lot of activities. So great work. Um, if I recall correctly, in the second or the third slide, um, some of the factors I think you mentioned contributing to low RI coverage were awareness and mistrust. And those, I think, are largely around communications-related activities. Um, could you talk maybe a little bit about how you might or how you have used sort of GIS technology to kind of improve your communications outreach or maybe make it more effective in terms of targeting the population audience uh, to get rid of the uh, lack of awareness and to sort of decrease the level of mistrust? Thanks. Leanne, you look keen to jump in here. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a great idea. We should do that. <laughs> so, so we agree with you. I, I think the work that we're doing is really opening the doors uh, for a lot of um, thinking about the, the use of GIS. And as I mentioned, um, I think there, there are other health areas or other areas that are, you know, uh, a little bit farther ahead in, in their thinking. Um, but if we can conceptualize the use of these uh, GIS maps for primary health care, for routinization, already there's a process that um, of validation with the communities um, to look at this and to discuss together and to plan together. So that's an opportunity to engage in terms of what are you planning for? Uh, why, why are we trying to find the distances and verify that those distances are, are so, or that these settlements are here? Um, so that allows for some sort of uh, engagement and community dialogue to take place. Uh, but a greater utility is to map them and to also use it to triangulate the data. So there is something that um, Nigeria is doing right now, and this is called a lot quality assurance sampling. And this is done every quarter. In the LQAs, they sample certain communities. And in those communities, the reasons for non-vaccination are also elicited. And so triangulating that data and mapping it with the GIS can, can allow us to see you know, communities based on you know, uh, these factors where there's low awareness or aware that low awareness, in fact, 
also um, triangulates with little service or no service um, or no schools. Um, so definitely, I think it's really something for for all of us in the room to think about um, how we might use GIS in a in a much um, um, stronger way, especially around the things that we're finding. Thank you. Any other questions? Because I have a couple, but I don't want to step in front of anyone. Um, I have been curious because uh, micro planning is something we talk a lot about in immunization, but it may not be understood by everyone um, equally and in depth. Sort of what piece of a micro planning process does a mapping exercise or a more accurate mapping exercise play? Falake, is that something you'd like to speak to? Uh, thanks, Lauren. I'm happy to, to speak to that. Um, the micro planning is, is the basis for uh, routinization uh, service planning, basically. Uh, the micro planning takes place at the primary unit, which is the health facility. And it should be a bottom up process where the health facility is able to determine the target population, how many settlements or villages does my facility serve? And based on that, how many outreaches do I need to provide? How many mobile services do I need to provide? And also looks at the vaccine requirements, the syringes, the cotton wools, the safety boxes, um, how many waste disposal units I need to have for the expected amount of waste uh, so that I don't have medical waste uh, um, issues. Um, so that, again, it forms the basis for planning. And in immunization, we have the planning templates, which speak to each of these. So the templates allow the health worker to map this all out and come out with what are the requirements and the subsequent resources that are need, needed to implement that, that plan. One of the things that um, we find is that when the micro plan is incorrect or of poor quality, it compromises. Uh, the services and the service delivery. So for example, um, if my health facility is serving 10 villages and out of those 10 villages, four of them live close enough to the health facility within an hour's walk, okay? Um, so I expect them to come. Three of them, I need to plan outreaches for them. And then the, the, the others, you know, I need to find some sort of mobile delivery that I can uh, I can reach them. If I fail to provide outreach services because, oh, maybe I have one, one community, one village that needs outreach services, so I'm just going to put one. I used one last year, which was wrong, by the way. I'm just going to use one this year. Um, and at the end of the day, when we're monitoring, with, oh, there are a number of unimmunized children here. Well, the health worker will give you their version of things. Well, yes, I have just one outreach because I have just one, one village that needs outreach. Um, but when you actually use the GIS to see, actually, there are three. And so there's been an under budget, there's been an under service, and has continued to, to, to foster uh, the number of unimmunized children because the services have not been delivered. Now, there are a myriad of reasons for um, non-immunization. And the mix, as Lauren mentioned, the number one reason was lack of awareness. The second reason, the second highest reason, was related to service delivery issues, which means our services get in there. Um, what are the quality of those services? So again, we really need to examine the underlying issues for us to be able to, to address them. And the micro plan is the basis for that. So you have good micro plans, it gives you the basis for good service delivery. Thank you. Thank you for helping me understand that a little bit better. Um, Lior, do you have a question? Yes, thanks so much. This was a really interesting presentation. Um, not. Uh, too much of an expert in this area, but I'm curious um, how this uh, system gets maintained going forward. Um, and you know, you mentioned 
um, local partners and actors that have um, some of the local capacity. Um, but you know, how often do these maps get updated, um, or what would be the recommendation for that? Um, and what kind of ownership have you seen to ensure that even if there is the capacity, there's the will to ensure that happens moving forward? So thanks. Great question. Very important question about sustainability. Leanne? Um, so in terms of um, ownership and capacity, so I think there, this is, I think we need to think about using GIS in sort of levels. And I, you know, I kind of alluded to the, the need for sort of the policy and operational guidance at the bottom, but this transfer of capacity is also part of that um, building up uh, your, your pyramid to the most perfect, beautiful map for planning. And, um, and so, you know, we need to have those, those policies and, and, and pol um, procedures in place, but also need to transfer the capacity. And, um, you know, I think for us, there was uh, some interest in sort of doing uh, organizational capacity assessment of the state to understand exactly where their needs are. They have some um, experience, uh, but there would be need to build more. Um, and then also to think about, you know, what type of skill transfer, if we're talking about training them on QGIS or other database management. Um, in terms of updating the maps, um, right now the VTS, which is kind of the driver, you know, because it has the population estimates and the list of settlements, that's updated um, at least, I think, once a year. Um, it's, it's pretty common. I'm not sure how if it will continue at that same um, rate if they achieve polio eradication, um, if they'll continue to sort of support that. So that would be something to think about. Um, but you know, for now, it's definitely an improvement on a 2006 census. <laughs> um, and in terms of the, the, the health workers and um, the states being vested in this, um, you know, we had to sit with them to work through the, the list of polio sediments and their settlements, and they really got to see firsthand where the differences were, and it bothered them. <laughs> they were really, so now they're super motivated to get, you know, to have everything in their hands because they want um, to know what settlements were they missing, what, um, you know, were they double counting, were, were some uh, health providers, health facilities including the same settlement. Um, were there issues where uh, maybe a health provider was assigning a settlement to an outreach um, uh, vaccination strategy because they get per diem when they do that, when it actually should be a fixed settlement so they could save some money. So there's um, a lot of potential gains, and they're uh, excited about that. Thank you. Are there any final questions before we wrap up or comments? Thank you all for being a great audience. Thank you to my colleagues. That was very interesting. Even for someone who knows something about it, I just learned a lot. So we have a few um, informational like fact sheets and handouts if you're interested in learning more, or um, you'd be welcome to contact any of us for more information. So thank you, and have a good afternoon.